Progress in the Knowledge of Christ, the Fifth Gospel. In today's discussion, I should like to speak first about what we can know, now know, about the Christ being from esoteric research, and then connect it to a discussion about the advances we have been able to make in the knowledge of Christ since the mystery of Golgotha. The great significance of the mystery of Golgotha for the entire evolution of the earth has been pointed out repeatedly within our spiritual movement. If the significance of the mystery of Golgotha is pursued further within occult research, one finds three preliminary stages of the mystery of Golgotha, which took place within the evolution of the earth and in connection with it. Three preliminary stages precede the mystery of Golgotha and prepare it, but they were not played out on the physical plane. Rather, they were played out in the higher worlds. The first of these events falls in the time of the Lemurian development of the world. The second and the third events fall in the time of the Atlantean development of the earth. And the fourth is the mystery of Golgotha, which took place on the physical plane in the post-Atlantean time, at the beginning of our time reckoning. In the Lemurian time, the same being that we know as the Christ being united itself with another being of the higher worlds, which did not incarnate on the physical plane, but rather belonged to the world of the upper hierarchies. And so, as we can speak of Christ incarnating in the body of Jesus of Nazareth in relation to the mystery of Golgotha, so can we speak about Christ taking up residence in an archangelic being of the higher worlds in the Lemurian age. We could say that an event similar to the later baptism by John on the physical plane transpired in the spiritual world during the Lemurian development. We meet, therefore, in that ancient time the Christ being in the soul body of an archangel. And through this sacrifice of the Christ being, its entry into the soul body of an archangel, a very particular effect was radiated into the development of the earth. In order to become familiar with the significance of this event, we must speak about a danger that stood before all human development in the Lemurian time through the forces of Lucifer. If this danger had not been deflected, everything we call the human faculties of sense perception would have come into disorder. The senses would not have developed under Luciferic influence as they have developed. Instead, they would have become much more sensitive, much more excitable in relation to the external world. For example, it would then have been necessary for human beings to go through the world like this. If we had seen a blue color, it would have, so to speak, sucked at our eyes, and we would have experienced something like a sucking force. And if we had seen the color red, we would have felt something like a piercing in the eyes. We must only imagine what we human beings would have become if at every step in our lives we were tossed about by nothing but exciting impressions through our sense perceptions. This danger was warded off because Christ ensouled himself in an ar archangelic being. I must say he did not incarnate. And the forces that therefore could shine out from the spiritual worlds poured themselves into the development of humanity, harmonizing the powers of the senses so that the danger was deflected and human beings obtained the necessary balance. Therefore, when we think today about how moderately our sense perceptions take their course, we can look back into the ancient Lemurian age and recognize that the sacrifice of Christ in ensouling himself in an archangelic being saved us from the danger of the hypersensitivity of our sense system. In the beginning of the Atlantean period, the second danger threatened human development, now through Lucifer and Armand together. This time the threat was an abnormal development of the life forces. These forces were about to develop in such a way that, for example, a hungry person would have pounced on food with bestial greed, 
On the other hand, any kind of food that was not good for people would have filled them with terrible disgust, and they would have fled from it. Hypersensitivity of the life forces threatened the human being at that time. Christ ensouled himself anew in an archangelic being of the upper hierarchies, and through this sacrifice the danger just described was warded off from humanity, and the life forces were brought into harmony in such a way that we can now use them in moderation and balance. The third danger threatened human development toward the end of the Atlantean age. The three soul forces, thinking, feeling, and willing, were about to lapse into disarray, and if this danger had not been deflected, they would have had a disorderly, confused, chaotic effect. If we want to understand the actual situation of this matter, we must understand clearly that the earth is not only what the geologists think it is, a mineral body, rather that the earth is an entire organism. What rises as foggy mist out of the ground of the earth is not only a physical mist, but also the embodiment of passions, with luciferic and aramonic forces, which can unite with the passions and instincts of human beings. In the time stated, these would have caused chaos in the thinking, feeling, and willing of the human soul, and if this danger had not been deflected, the entire human race would have lapsed into a sort of delirium. The human race would have developed a state of madness, which would have become the normal condition of the earth. At that point the Christ being ensouled himself in an archangelic being for the third time, and warded off this danger through what could be once again radiated into the development of humanity from this sacrifice. The effect of this third ensoulment of the Christ being is the harmonizing of thinking, feeling, and willing in the nature of the human soul. The Greeks, who sensed something like after-images of the processes during the Atlantean age, expressed the supersensible fact I have just described in their mythology, and the image, the after-image, in which the Greeks represented the third ensoulment of Christ in an archangelic being, is Apollo, the sun god. Apollo, as the protector of the Pythia's pronouncements, appears as the being who harmonizes the dragon, which rises up out of the earth in the form of steam. If this mist had flowed into the passion of Pythia without Apollo's harmonization, thinking, feeling, and willing would have been expressed as madness. Through impregnation with the powers of Apollo, the Pythia's sayings became some of the wisest counsels given to the Greeks. If one had been able to ask initiates in the ancient mysteries for their honest opinion of who Apollo was, they would most certainly have answered, quote, He is the precursor of Christ Jesus, who has not yet descended to the physical plane, unquote. Humanity has received a wonderful imagination of this third Christ event in the picture St. George defeats the dragon or the archangel Michael defeats the dragon. It is wonderful to be able to be attentive to how this imagination of St. George defeating the dragon is a reverberation of the third supersensible Christ event. And the fourth event came in the post-Atlantean time when, once again in the course of evolution, humanity was exposed to the danger of lapsing into disorder with respect to the forces of the soul. Now the human capital I itself was headed into disorder. The first danger consisted in the forces of the senses lapsing into disorder, the second danger in the life forces lapsing into disorder, the third danger in the soul forces, thinking, feeling, and willing, lapsing into disorder. The fourth danger, in the forces of the I, lapsing into disorder. The same being that had ensouled himself in a being three times before, the Christ being, now incarnated in Jesus of Naz Nazareth in the mystery of Golgotha, to ward off this fourth danger from humanity through his radiating into the earth's aura. In the development of humanity in the centuries preceding and following the mystery of Golgotha, 
we can see how the danger that was about to bring the I and its power into disorder was present. In Greek philosophy, in Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, already begun by Thales and Heraclitus, we can observe the blossoming of the forces of the I, and we see also how something else makes its appearance alongside that blossoming. As the power of thinking, human thinking in Thales, Heraclitus, in Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle blossomed, we see spreading over the entire civilized part of the earth at approximately the same time the powers of the so-called sibyls showing themselves here and there. These sibyls appearing as a parallel phenomenon beside the emergence of philosophy make clear how chaos was about to penetrate the forces of the eye. On the one hand, we see how what these sibyls proclaimed was true, soundly prophetic, and on the other hand, we see misunderstandings, deceptive, disordered eye forces speaking through them. Michelangelo, drawing on tradition at a later date, shows wonderfully in the Sistine Chapel how the chaotic and earthly speaks out of the sibyls. Right into the representation of the gestures, we can see how the disorder of the eye forces worked through the individual sibyls and comes to expression in many different ways. Moreover, Michelangelo set up, beside the Sibylline powers, as a polar opposite, those who had attempted to seek the eye, to discover the eye in human nature, and to make it fertile for the historical development of humanity. These are the prophets. In Michelangelo, the Sibyls and the prophets represent both polarities. On the one side, the tendency of the eye to lapse into disorder. On the other, the seeking of the Hebrew prophets to bring the forces of the eye into order. The real awakening to consciousness of the eye that was to occur was fermenting in human nature, and if the danger had not been deflected, dark prophetic sibylline forces would, have, would be tumbling in confusion in our eye today. A real clarity of the eye would not have been possible in the development of the following centuries. Then the incarnation of Christ in Jesus of Nazareth occurred at the time of this fermentation and brought about for the fourth time the harmonizing of human nature. This could only happen because the Christ being incarnated in a human being who had developed in the highest sense the capacities accessible to human beings at that time. Just as modern esoteric research makes it possible to cast light on the four stages of the mystery of Golgotha, it also puts us in a position to throw light on the nature of Jesus of Nazareth, in whom the Christ being incarnated through the mystery of Golgotha, the fourth and last stage. I drew attention on earlier occasions to the fact that at the beginning of our time reckoning two Jesus infants were born. I pointed out that in the twelfth year of one of the boys, who was descended from the Nathan line of the house of David, the soul of the other Jesus boy, who was of the Solomon line, took up residence so that the two Jesus boys became one being. If we ask ourselves who this twelve-year-old Jesus of Nazareth was, then modern esoteric research answers that it was the soul of Zoroaster in a very special human being who was descended from the Nathan line of the house of David. And if we now turn our spiritual gaze to the being of Zoroaster in the Nathan Jesus, we see how this Jesus of Nazareth developed further up until his thirtieth year. We can distinguish three periods in the development of this Jesus of Nazareth. The first from the twelfth to the eighteenth year, the second from the eighteenth to the twenty-fourth year, and the third from about the twenty-fourth to the thirtieth year. The young Jesus of Nazareth lived in the house headed by his real father and the mother of the Solomon Jesus boy. Both his birth mother and the father of the Solomon Jesus boy had died in the meantime. The young Jesus of Nazareth was brought into the trade of his father a sort of cabinet and carpentry workshop. Besides this, however, he developed remarkably in his soul with infinite perfection in spiritual life. 
We must bear in mind that no one from his family understood the deeply significant development of the young Jesus of Nazareth. Already as a boy of twelve to eighteen years, he was isolated with it, entirely alone with it. This inner development, which was accomplished in the loneliness of the soul, was remarkable, because Jesus of Nazareth could bring up, as from the deep foundation of his soul, all the great revelations that had come to the Hebrew people over the course of time. At the time when Jesus of Nazareth lived, the people of Israel had hardly anything but the written records of what the ancient prophets had once received in direct revelation from the spiritual worlds. They knew from the texts what the ancients had received as revelations, but they no longer had any possibility of reaching the revelations themselves, which had once come to the ancient prophets through the voice of one called the great Bath Kol. Jesus of Nazareth experienced in himself as in a reversed development everything the Hebrew people had lived through, and he developed himself to the point that his soul sensed, quote, The great Bath Kol is speaking to me again. I am perceiving directly from the spiritual world the voice the prophets once received. Unquote. And, as happens with a spiritual development of this sort, this inner development was connected with the deepest pain and suffering. The human being does not gain the highest knowledge without pain and suffering. One experience specifically was stored up in the soul of the roughly 17 to 18 year old Jesus of Nazareth, as he recognized, quote, Once the great Bath Kol pronounced the most wonderful revelations to the Hebrew people. But if the great Bath Kol were to speak to the Hebrew people today, no one would hear it. They understand the scripture, but they no longer understand the living scripture. Unquote. He was lonely within himself. A vast sadness came over his soul for what had become of his people in the declining evolution of humanity. Then came the time when Jesus of Nazareth was to be sent out into the world. He wandered, practicing his craft here and there in different areas, within Palestine as well as outside it in pagan areas. In his wanderings, Jesus made a remarkable impression on the people he encountered. What had caused the pain in this soul had been transformed into something like love, which the people felt streaming out from him when in his presence. When, in his way, he sat in the evenings after finishing his work with the people he visited, they felt as if an atmosphere of love came over them, with his words but also with his mere presence. What was imbued with love, what he could discuss with them, made the deepest impression on people, and when he had gone away to work somewhere else, something like the most lively remembrance of, rem remembrance of him remained behind with those he had left. It often happened that the people whom Jesus of Nazareth had left three of four weeks before had a common vision that he came to them once again and spoke with them. The vision spoke with them. So deep was the impression that this Jesus of Nazareth made that he had basically remained with them. What Jesus of Nazareth was imprinted... Excuse me, let me read that again. <clears throat> what Jesus of Nazareth was imprinted itself on hundreds and thousands of souls as he wandered about in his eighteenth to twenty-fourth years. In this wandering, Jesus of Nazareth also went into pagan areas. He came one day to a place where the people were in despair. This place had been abandoned by its priests. There was a sacrificial altar, but it was desolate. The priests had fled because a vicious disease had broken out among the people. Such sacrificial altars and cultic rites were derived from the mysteries. What had been revealed in the mysteries had been carried over into the ceremonial acts at these sacrificial altars. To understand such a thing, we must take note of the meaning of the ceremonial sacrifice. Through the way the sacrificial rituals were performed and the prayers that imbued them, spiritual forces really flowed down onto the altars. However, when Jesus came to the sanctuary, he found that the good forces that had once flowed down onto the altars during sacrifices were no longer there. 
he found that the sanctuaries which had been abandoned by the priests were populated by demonic powers gathered around the altar. Even the desperate, sick, degraded people of this pagan place had a deep impression as they noticed Jesus of Nazareth approaching, whom they did not know, but who poured out an atmosphere of love. At first they believed that one of their old priests had come back to offer up their pagan sacrifices. Jesus of Nazareth obviously did not want to perform the pagan sacrifices, but he walked among the people. <clears throat> there he was seized by the power of the demons around the altar and keeled over as if dead. When the people saw this, they fled. While falling into unconsciousness, Jesus of Nazareth saw the demonic powers pursuing them. Then he lost normal consciousness and was carried off into spiritual worlds, where he could now perceive what had once been revealed to the priests of the, of the ancient mysteries in purity and truth. He could perceive the ancient pagan revelations, just as he had perceived the Hebrew revelations in the voice of Bath Kol. And he could hear the ancient pagan revelation, which can be repeated in the language of today in roughly the following way, quote, Aum, Amen. Evil's reign, bearing witnesses to I-ness, separating itself and to selfhood's guilt incurred through others, experienced in the daily bread, wherein the will of heaven does not reign, because humanity has separated itself from forgotten your names, ye fathers in the heavens." Unquote. And Jesus of Nazareth knew, in his altered state of consciousness, that this revelation flowed through the very ancient sacred teachings of the mysteries. He awakened and retained the memory of what were once the ancient sacred doctrines of the pagan religions. He then turned what he had received in this revelation around for the further progress of humanity, and it became the Lord's Prayer. What one learns in relation to the higher worlds is not learned merely through doctrines, but much more through facts that one experiences in the higher worlds. The entire meaning of such a revelation is learned in an infinitely deeper way than one can ever learn through doctrines or theories. A new great pain was stored up in the soul of Jesus of Nazareth. He had before him an especially clear case of the miserable state of the pagan revelations, and now he could contrast it with what they had once been. And just as he could say in the midst of the Hebrew people that even in the voice of the great Bath Kol, excuse me, that even if the voice of the great Bath Kol were to sound forth, he would be isolated with it because they could no longer understand it. Now he could say in respect to these people that if the voices of the ancient pagan mysteries were to sound again everywhere, there would be no one there who could understand it. Thus Jesus of Nazareth was destined to experience the declining development of humanity in the deepest anguish. The story I have just told took place in Jesus of Nazareth's twenty-fourth year, approximately. Shortly after that he went back home. It was approximately the time when his father died in Nazareth. While he was back at home in Nazareth, between his twenty-fourth and thirtieth years, he came into contact with the Essenes, who had settlements in the immediate area. He did not actually become an Essene, but due to his deep soul life, through the great twofold anguish that had been stored in his soul and transformed into love, the Essenes accepted him and spoke with him often about their deepest secrets, which they otherwise would have spoken about only to their own, to initiates. Only to him did they speak of their deepest secrets. And among the Essenes he became acquainted with people who at that time aspired, through a special inner development, to climb up again to the point from which humanity had devolved downward. He took in eagerly what he could learn from the Essenes about the human development for such an ascent. One day as he was leaving the house of the Essenes and went through the doorway, he had an especially notable vision. On either side of the doorway he saw two forms, which he later knew to be Lucifer and Araman. They ran away from the door into the rest of the world. Through what he had gone through in his own inner development, 
He was now so advanced that he could, so to speak, read the meaning of this flight of Lucifer and Ahriman from the Essenes' door in the occult script. <clears throat> he saw that it was still possible at that time for individual people to rise up to the spiritual heights through a special development of their souls. However, this could happen only at the expense of the rest of humanity, for only a few elect could go through the Essene development, and they could do so only because others remained at lower levels. He knew that the Essenes freed themselves from Lucifer and Araman through their mystical development, and that Lucifer and Araman had, therefore, to flee from the Essene houses. They ran straight to the other people and attacked the rest of humanity all the more. And from this occult experience, the third great pain came over him when he realized that while certain especially elect people could ascend to what had been revealed to people earlier, they could only climb up at the expense of the rest of humanity. That almost tore his heart out, for he was filled with love for all people. As a result of the third pain, he understood that in whatever way contemporary individuals rose to higher spiritual knowledge, this knowledge had to be taken away from the rest of the people as a result. <clears throat> However high a soul might climb, whatever it might know in order to share the experience of the Essenes, the other people on this broad earth were far too wretched for this. As Jesus of Nazareth experienced such things, he learned that his stepmother or foster mother had more and more understanding for his inner life. This was particularly the case since the death of his father, and while in earlier years he was alone and lonely within the family, now he had many conversations with his mother in which he could speak of what he experienced in his soul, and a great decisive conversation between Jesus of Nazareth and his mother took place in the thirtieth year of his life. One day he spoke to her of every bit of knowledge he had laid up in his soul since his twelfth year, hearing the voice of the great Bath Cole the cosmic Lord's Prayer, and the experience among the Essenes. And he spoke to her in such a way that this conversation had a deeply shattering effect, even when deciphered later by esoteric research in the Akashic Chronicle. What he said reached his mother not just as words, but as living forces, which carried the essence of the soul of Jesus of Nazareth as if on wings, into the essence of the soul of the mother. So deeply connected was Jesus of Nazareth with what he had to clothe in words that his suffering and his knowledge flowed with the words over into the heart and soul of his mother. And it was as if his mother were imbued with a new life, as if rejuvenated, she came to life anew. Jesus of Nazareth, however, came into a totally different state of soul, so to speak. He had let his own eye flow out in his words, with which he was so intimately connected. The eye of Zoroaster had left the three bodies, the physical, etheric, and astral bodies of Jesus of Nazareth, and the forces of the cosmos went to work within the three bodies. Without eye consciousness, as in a dream, Jesus of Nazareth, who had breathed out his Zoroaster eye in the conversation with his mother, was impelled on the way to John the Baptist. Thus was he prepared, after giving up this Zoroaster eye, to take up the Christ being as his new eye. With that, the mystery of Golgotha, the fourth stage of the Christ events, was now prepared. It transpired during the three years in which Christ lived in the body of Jesus of Nazareth up until the mystery of Golgotha. First, at the Whitsun event, did the apostles awaken out of another state of consciousness and grasp what had transpired with Christ Jesus. If we survey what is known at this time about the Christ being as a result of present-day esoteric research, can we then say that our heart and soul would be less shaken by these revelations for our time than by the revelations about Jesus and Christ of an earlier time? The esoteric science of our day puts us in the position of knowing something more and deeper of Jesus Christ than bygone centuries have known. We may well say that the form of Christ grows to cosmic proportions when we strive to know it with the means that modern spiritual science puts at our disposal. 
Let us look back at what was given to an earlier humanity about Jesus Christ, for example in the four Gospels. From an esoteric standpoint, it is very clear to us that the men who wrote the Gospels wrote them according to the inspirations of the ancient mysteries and out of an atavistic clairvoyance. I have referred to this in my book titled Christianity as Mystical Fact. Paul was the first to have an impression of the cosmic significance of Christ. He could perceive how the power of the Christ being flowed into the aura of the earth. What struck Paul as a particular point in the knowledge of Christ can, if we deepen the esotericism of our time, dawn on us as useful for the further fields of knowledge of Christ. For the moment the vision of Paul is extended from the mystery of Golgotha to its three precursors, the moment it is extended from what for Paul is almost only the awareness of Jesus of Nazareth to the life of Christ Jesus, then the Pauline method will spread, to a certain degree, from one single center out over the whole great manifestation of the life of Christ Jesus. The moment we can now, in this way, through devoted esoteric research, come to the point of making the Pauline method, so to speak, a universal one for the knowledge of Christ, then a real advance in the knowledge of Christ has been accomplished. I did not wish to speak abstractly about the development of progress in the understanding of Christ. Rather, I wanted to demonstrate concretely what sort of Christ knowledge can be attained through esoteric science today. It will have become apparent to us from today's discussion that spiritual science as we mean it can be an instrument for ever deeper knowledge of the Christ. It is to be hoped that when humanity has come so far in rejecting old religious ideas about Christ because of materialistic influences, then modern spiritual science will give Christ back to humanity once again. For this spiritual science is not speaking out of theories about Christ, but rather in consciousness of the very words of Christ, quote, I am with you until the end of the earth's days, unquote. For Christ is poured into the aura of the earth in which we ourselves are embedded. He lives within it. And just as the apostles once lived with Christ Jesus on the physical plane, so can we communicate and associate with him as a spiritual being in the earth's aura, if we appropriate this possibility. We must only accustom ourselves to really grasping the living presence of Christ in the earth's aura and not to identify Christianity as a mere teaching, a mere doctrine. Since the mystery of Golgotha, Christ is here all around us. We find him in the same world we are in, not in a physical form, but as a spiritual being. And we can see that he is active as a being, independent of what people are capable of thinking about him. Have we not experienced how in councils and other places of dispute the opinions and the doctrines about Christ have gone back and forth, and how people were not capable of getting things right with their thoughts about Christ? How many opinions about Christ have we endured? If the further development of the Christ impulse were dependent on the opinions of people, the situation would really be bad for this further development of the Christ impulse. This Christ impulse is in the evolution of the earth as a living reality and works in it as a reality without regard for what people think about him. In order to make this sort of thing present for us, let us look at the date of October 28, 312. At that time Constantine, the son of Constantius Chlorus, stood before the gates of Rome, which was ruled by Maxentius. Constantine approached Rome with his relatively smaller army whereas Maxentius had a significantly larger army at his disposal. Maxentius was safe within the walls of Rome. Constantine advanced in the open field. The battle fought at that time decided the map of Europe. A person who studies the story in its depths will have to admit that on that occasion the ideas of the generals were not de decisive, nor were the rational reasons of people, but something entirely different. Maxentius consulted the Sibylline books and received an answer, quote, If you attack Constance, Constantine outside the gates of Rome, you will destroy Rome's greatest enemy, unquote. a proper oracle. 
and in the night preceding the battle Maxentius had a dream which drove him to leave the secure position within the walls of Rome and to march against Constantine. However, Constantine also had a dream that night which advised him to have the symbol of Christ carried in front of his army and to conquer in this sign. No rational grounds, no strategic reasons, no expertise in the nature of war played a role when it came to the decisive moment. Rather, subconscious forces stood opposed to each other in Maxentius and Constantine. One may think whatever one likes about the merit or lack of it in Constantine's thinking. In the victory he won at that time, the impulse of Christ lived as a true, real force which worked through the subconscious of human beings since the mystery of Golgotha, regardless of what people thought about Christ. This is only one of the many events that could be brought to attest to how the Christ impulse at first entered into the subconscious forces of the soul. These subconscious soul forces might otherwise have passed over into the Sibylline and have worked its way to the surface. And while the superficial conscious soul forces press more and more for the loss of the understanding of Christ through the materialistic stream, the Christ works on in the subconscious forces of human souls, as he worked in Constantine and Maxentius. Today it is necessary for us to become conscious of what has been working in the subconscious forces of the soul. We should consciously recognize the being that since the mystery of Golgotha has been working in the earth's aura, in the souls of humanity, and from this aura has determined the destiny of the evolution of the world and of humanity. By holding this in our consciousness, we understand the progress that human understanding has made in reference to the Christ, and we understand our own task in relation to the advances in the knowledge of Christ.